The first thing I want to do is welcome everybody to our May chapter meeting. Uh, my name is Bob Locke, and I am the chapter president of Twin Cities Trout Unlimited. I'm going to make a few announcements, and then I'm going to formally introduce our speaker, Evan Griggs. And I guess I don't need to introduce his mom since she's already been introduced. Uh, first and foremost, a big welcome to any new members or anybody who is attending a chapter meeting for the first time. I wish we could greet you in person, uh, but if you are new and you're not too shy, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Our chapter meetings are open to everybody, whether or not they are a member of Trout Unlimited. But if you're not yet a member of Trout Unlimited, please consider joining. We have a special half price um, offer for new members, and I'll put a link to that offer in the chat later on. I should also mention that by attending this meeting, you are all going to be entered into a random number drawing to win a box of flies tied by our chapter president and fly tying maestro, Paul Johnson. The market value of these flies is something like $2,000, but they will be given to you absolutely free. I, if you uh, win the flies, or even if you don't, and you're interested in supporting uh, TCTU's efforts, if you go to our website, you'll find a way that you can donate to uh, Twin Cities Trout Unlimited. I, we have had a busy May, and it's been so busy that I'm actually going to geek out and I'm going to put up a presentation uh, to show you all what we've been up to. And uh, potentially ask for your help in, uh, uh, in doing some volunteer activities. And you have to forgive me because people are still joining the meeting. So I'm gonna, um, hopefully when I put this up and share my screen, I'll still be able to let people into the chat, but I'm gonna be a little bit busy. I should have, um, I guess I should have organized it so I could have somebody else present this, but bear with me. Thomas Walkington, you have your hand raised. Is, I assume that's a, a, a thumbs up for uh, Evan's mom, or do you have a question? Okay, anyway, here we go. So uh, like I said, we've had a busy May and uh, with the vaccination rates increasing and uh, the COVID cases going down, the state is starting to open up and we are starting to open up too at Twin Cities Trout Unlimited. And we're able to do a lot of things, uh, uh, start doing a lot of the things that, that are important to fulfilling our mission. And of course, one of those is to improve habitat. And we actually, uh, on May 15th, uh, a week and a half ago, uh, we conducted our first project, Habitat project since the pandemic. Uh, we had a team of five people out with Mark Nemeth of the DNR, uh, cutting buckthorn, removing canary grass, and uh, planting native seeds to replace the canary grass. You can see Steve Coccola out there. He is our Habitat coordinator with a, a, a backpack sprayer. He actually got out a little bit early to spray the canary grass so that um, it had died down enough to do the native seed planting. Uh, Steve has uh, plans for more projects and he's interested in having habitat improvement volunteers. So if you would like to get out uh, and work on uh, some projects, uh, please get hold of Steve and he will put you on his mailing list. We are also doing a kind of a mini habitat project on a whole bunch of streams. And that is we're doing a Facebook photo contest until the end of this month, uh, encouraging people to pick up some trash, take a picture of themselves. Uh, and then just, uh, if you go to our Facebook page, you'll see a uh, posting for this uh, photo uh, contest and just reply to that 
uh, Facebook post with your photo and in the comments uh, mention where you picked up the trash. Fishing is permitted while you pick up trash. Uh, we do have some great prizes and this is a great uh, way to get out and uh, show the streams that you love them. And uh, it runs through the end of the month. So I'm hoping a lot of you will get out during the Memorial Day weekend, have some fun on the stream, pick up some trash, take a photo and post it on Facebook. Uh, just go to our Facebook page uh, and you'll find all the details. We're also starting a pilot program that we're calling Stream Keepers. Uh, and uh, we're starting this on a couple of uh, the most important metro area streams, uh, Hay Creek, the South Branch of the Vermilion and Trout Brook. And basically what we're trying to do is really keep a close eye on these streams um, and uh, make sure that they're well taken care of. And we've recruited a team of people who are going to be taking water quality measurements using a, an app, which uh, can be used with a test strip uh, you swirl around in the water and you get uh, some important uh, chemistry measurements like nitrates, nitrites, pH, hardness, and so forth, phosphorus, that give you an idea of the health of the water. You can also take the water temperature, you can make comments on the stream, uh, note obstacles or anything like that. Uh, so at any rate, we have a team who's taking these water quality measurements on a regular basis on these target streams. Uh, particularly when we have flooding events. And we'll also be rolling this out to, uh, to all of you uh, to, uh, uh, if you're interested in using this on these streams or any stream that you would like to uh, throughout the country. Uh, a couple of other things that the stream keepers are going to do will be to um, walk the stream from time to time, keep an eye on it, pick up small amounts of litter, if there are any issues with habitat improvement projects, uh, eroded banks and so forth, report those to our habitat managers. And finally, just communicate with our TU community in our newsletter and on Facebook on what's going on with the stream, any issues they found, stream etiquette, any issues they found with the landlord and so forth, landowners and so forth. Uh, the stream keepers that we signed up uh, also uh, worked with the trout in the classroom program. Uh, they assisted with trout releases and the kids uh, uh, actually used that WISE H2O app to test the water quality. And since the kids had been, um, you know, raising trout in aquariums, it was actually amazing how much they already knew about water chemistry and water quality. So this was a really great opportunity for us to get out and work with the, the trout in the classroom. Uh, at any rate, if you are interested in a kind of combination keeping eye on the stream uh, and uh, also this WISE H2O app, which is a kind of citizen science, then please contact Jim Souter, who is the stream keepers coordinator and his email address is there. And just in case you guys are wondering, I will uh, send out an email uh, sometime this week with a summary of the chapter meeting and I'll include all this information. Uh, let's see. I think this is just about my last slide, uh, but we uh, are planning to do a lot of um, activity this summer as volunteers and particularly outreach to the community. Uh, there's a camp that's gonna be going on in Lanesboro, Minnesota called Toon Camp, which stands for the ultimate nature experience. It's a whole bunch of 11 to 16 year olds who go down to Lanesboro to learn about the outdoors, learn about hunting, learn about fishing. And uh, they uh, need volunteers to help kids learn how to fly fish, uh, to learn how to cast and learn how to tie flies. I, we're also going to be teaching TCTU members and their friends to do fly casting in the Twin Cities area. And finally, we're gonna be working with um, kids and families at about, I think, 15 different sites throughout the Metro this summer, uh, uh, teaching them how to fish. A lot of these kids and families have never been out fishing. This is not trout fishing, obviously. A couple, couple of times, actually, they will go out to Trout Brook, but. But if you're interested in you know, connecting with kids and families and uh, getting them excited about the joy of fishing, 
uh, or if you're interested in any of the programs that are listed here, uh, please get a hold of Gary Whitrock. Uh, he's uh, been coordinating all these programs and he can um, get you signed up um, to volunteer. So that is my plug for volunteering, uh, as well as uh, some information on uh, what our chapter has been up to. Uh, we really, uh, I think we are opening up fast and uh, I really am looking forward to a great summer, uh, you know, commuting with our friends, getting out fishing and uh, contributing to achieving our mission. I, but uh, probably the main reason that you all came here tonight was not to listen to me, but to listen to our guest speaker, uh, Evan Griggs. So without further ado, let me introduce him. Uh, Evan grew up attending TCTU meetings. He received help from TCTU back in the day to support the fly fishing club he started while he attended Southwest High School. The investment paid off and he's now an avid fly fisher, fly fishing guide and outfitter. And he's the environmental education specialist for the trout in the classroom program in Minnesota. Evan is also a board member of Twin Cities Trout Unlimited and he's the membership coordinator. So if you're a new member, you'll probably hear from Evan. And if you get behind on your dues, you'll hear from Evan too. Uh, so uh, at any rate, uh, he's been very busy uh, and he's uh, made a big impact already uh, working on the, the TCTU board. Uh, and uh, uh, we're, we're really thrilled to have him on the board, but particularly we're thrilled to have him talk uh, tonight. Uh, he lives in Fridley, Minnesota with his wife and baby daughter, but in case you're wondering, he's not in Fridley now, I'll let him tell you where he is himself. Uh, after he finishes his talk, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Uh, we do have a large group tonight. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, please put your questions into the chat. And uh, once Evan is done with his presentation, I'll read those questions off to Evan. So I'm going to, um, I, I think everybody is already on mute. If you're not on mute, please put yourself on mute. And I'm going to turn it over to Evan, who doesn't need to mute himself and take it away. All right, thanks, Bob. And thank you all for showing up tonight. Uh, like he said, I am not in Fridley. Uh, you might see a pretty cool flamingo behind me there. I'm actually coming at you live from Sarasota, Florida. Um, and uh, I've got some lovely family members around the corner here. If you can see them, hello, that's my brother and my wife. Uh, we're all hanging out uh, at a new family vacation house here. We're going to try uh, fishing some cool waters tomorrow, I hope. And yeah, hopefully, probably the pool. The flamingo might put up a good fight, actually. Um, and we went for a walk this afternoon, and we, we, we moved probably a six-foot alligator. And I got to figure that would be a pretty sweet topwater bite. So uh, we'll give it a try tomorrow. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to share my screen with everybody here, and we are going to learn more about urban and uncommon fly fishing. Uh, so here we go. Give me a thumbs up if you can see that screen just to make sure everybody's on the same page. All right. Thanks, Mom. Uh, <laughs> so uh, urban and uncommon fly fishing. Uh, uh, I'm Evan Griggs. Again, I'm the head guide and outfitter for Bob Mitchell's Fly Shop. I'm also the environmental education specialist for the Trout in the Classroom program uh, across Minnesota. And I've been fly fishing now for about 20 years. Uh, I've been a professional guide for 11 of those. Uh, and I started when I was uh, fly fishing, that is. I started fly fishing when I was around 10 years old. Uh, and we would actually go every Saturday down to Hay Creek, which is a major restoration project uh, site for TCTU. Um, and I would watch my dad, I call him a part-timer. He did it a, a few times and I would watch him on the bank. And uh, boy, I, I just remember I was around 10. I remember thinking to myself, I haven't seen this guy catch any fish doing this. Uh, so I was determined at that point to teach myself how to do it. 
Uh, and growing up in South Minneapolis, there's not too many trout streams around there. Um, so I used what was readily av available and what I was already doing in my free time. Uh, and that was fishing the, the warm water uh, systems that were near my uh, home, especially that were within uh, biking distance. Uh, so I cut my teeth on bluegills and bass, uh, pike and Minnehaha Creek or uh, Lake Harriet, things like that. Um, so I've, I've been spending years, almost three decades now, uh, worth of time on these watersheds. Um, and I just absolutely love them. They are underappreciated. They're definitely underfished. Uh, so tonight I'm going to share uh, some of the things I've learned about them. Uh, over the years with you all, um, and I hope to see you out at some of these spots. So here we go on to the next slide here. So why go urban fly fishing? Uh, the best part about it is it's a multi-species opportunity. Uh, we have 1,023 different fish species in Minnesota. Did you know that? One over a thousand different types of fish. It's insane. Uh, and you probably know a few of them, um, but the best part about fishing in the urban area is that we get so many uh, different opportunities to catch different species. Uh, you really go to some of these areas and you don't know what is on the other end of your line. Um, and that for me as someone who's been doing this forever is super exciting. It could be anything from a, a four inch crappie to a 20 pound channel catfish. You just don't know until it hits the net. Uh, uh, it's, I've, I've definitely seen that range for sure. Uh, I also really like it because it's a quick fix. Um, I'm, a, I'm a new father and you know, uh, uh, I, I used to you know, hum and ha when people would say, man, I just don't have any time to get out. Uh, but now being a new father, I understand. I'm sorry I uh, didn't believe you before, but yeah, time is a finite resource, <laughs> especially when you top it off with jobs and whatever else you got going on. Uh, so um, most of our trout streams in the metro area are, are kind of a, a far drive um, with the exception, exception, of course, of maybe the Vermilion and a few others. Um, uh, much closer opportunities could be the pond, creek, or lake that's a couple miles down the road from your home. Um, and there are a bunch of fish in there, I guarantee it. Uh, and most of these areas are relatively under pressured and underappreciated. Um, and I'm, that's not to say that you won't see other anglers out there. Um, and definitely if you go to the big name lakes like Minnetonka or uh, something of this sort, you're gonna see people um, but the, the great thing is, is that we have such a huge amount of water in such a, uh, a condensed area that if you see five boats drive two more minutes down the road, and you're at a, a completely different spot that will likely be empty. Um, uh, Underappreciated because uh, these areas don't have crystal clear water. They just don't. Um, and often they're littered or they're uh, is a lot of development or something like that. And um, uh, unfortunately, a stigma with, with a lot of these waters, if it's, if it's dirty, uh, it's gross and it's uh, lifeless. Um, and that's just not the case. Uh, I also like to remember that nature is everywhere. Just because there's humans and there's development uh, doesn't mean there's not nature. Uh, believe it or not, I've probably seen more, uh, more wildlife below the Stone Arch Bridge than I ever have uh, up north in the woods or something. There's beavers, there's turtles, there's eagles, there's loons, there's all sorts of crazy stuff right in the heart of downtown Minneapolis. Um, and also, uh, one of the coolest parts of being an urban fly fisher is you get to look super duper cool uh, in front of total strangers. Um, one of I, this happened a lot as I was a kid uh, fishing in uh, Lake Harriet, I would get crowds of people on the shoreline watching me and my friend catch bluegills and bass along the weed edge um, on a sandbar. And uh, this was back in before the time a lot of people were doing this. Um, so people, I, I, you know, because sound carries over the water more than on more than one occasion, I've heard them, wow, they're such great gymnasts at ribbon twirling. <laughs> I was like, no, this is a manly sport. We are catching fish. Uh, 
Uh, we also ended up on the news a couple times. One of them was just to say, hey, there are fish in here. Uh, the other article uh, that they were reporting on uh, was how uh, unhealthy, how high the mercury levels were in the fish in the metro waters. And they asked us, uh, would you ever eat something out of a lake? And we said, no, uh, we're catch and release anglers because we are fly fishers. But, um, you know, go to other urban areas, you'll get crowds of people up on bridges cheering you out when you catch a big fish. It's just a really unique thing um, that if you're into that, it's pretty cool. So what are some of the options in just, and this is just Minneapolis and St. Paul proper. Uh, there are uh, over 2,300 acres of lakes uh, with a total of 15 different lakes. There's 26 river miles on the Mississippi River, and there's 17 creek miles uh, between uh, Shingle Creek uh, Minnehaha and Bassett Creek. Uh, Bassett is the one that flows underground for two miles underneath downtown. Uh, I haven't fished under underground yet. I'm sure there's something cool down there though, if you ever make your way in there. Um, and once you leave that uh, 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 proper boundary of, of both Minneapolis and St. Paul, you literally have a lifetime worth of water you could go and fish. Uh, just just dozens and dozens of lakes, rivers, streams. Um, there's really no end in sight. So uh, if you ever find yourself short on time, wanting to catch some, uh, either a few big fish or a bunch of, uh, just a bunch of smaller fish, drive down the road uh, to your local pond or lake. There's probably something in there. So what can I catch? The real question is team, uh, what can't you catch? Uh, there's everything from smallmouth bass to carp to catfish to drum to muskies, uh, pike. Um, if you're an unlucky uh, uh, angler, you might even hook a mallard. Uh, sometimes that's just what you got to deal with. Watch your back cast for sure for pedestrians as well. Uh, but our, my whole theme of the night tonight, um, not only will I tell you some of my favorite spots, um, I'm also going to tell you some of the species that you can catch. Uh, both um, uh, game and rough fish species, uh, how to catch them and my favorite flies to do it as well. So here we go. So our primary game fish species are uh, the panfish family, uh, crappies, bluegills, pumpkin seeds, uh, things of that nature. Um, technically bass are in that sunfish family as well, but we I put them in a different column here because uh, we use different strategies. So we also have many, many large and smallmouth bass in our lakes, uh, streams, and rivers. Um, and we have pike and muskies. Uh, pike are uh, naturalized to the areas, and muskies are routinely stocked, tiger muskies to be specific. Um, so we have a, a whole bunch of panfish. They're in very high abundance in the lakes. Uh, and a few of the larger streams, especially Minnehaha, um, in the Mississippi River, um, we, we do see them uh, in a little bit lower numbers. Uh, but uh, any fly will work for them. If you're just learning how to fly fish, I saw a whole bunch of new folks in the chat. Welcome to the sport, happy to have you. Uh, this is the best way, most fun way to start fly fishing. They just do not care what you got on there. Uh, if you have a one weight to a three weight, even a five weight, they are just a blast. Uh, my favorite times to get to them uh, really is, uh, especially June through July, um, if you have access to a boat, uh, like a kayak or something, you could even start them as early as uh, ice out in April. And obviously my favorite spot for those guys is Lake Harriet. Um, they have huge bluegills in there and nobody really knows about it. Um, don't be afraid to uh, fish away from those uh, two fishing piers on Harriet's. Uh, there's a few sandbars on uh, the north side and the, and the west side uh, that ha will, they'll very soon here, if not already, because the season's kind of uh, running ahead of schedule, uh, they will be uh, making their beds in shallow on those sides, and it is just a blast. Uh, for the bass, we have a whole bunch of largemouth in the lakes, 
Uh, we've got a few largies in the uh, creek and uh, a handful in the river. They mostly get washed in from the creek and other lakes uh, into the big river. Uh, but we have also a very healthy population of smallmouth bass uh, in the Mississippi through downtown, uh, both downtowns. Um, my favorite uh, flies for those guys, uh, any medium to large streamer, especially a crayfish pattern uh, for, their, for those small mouth. Um, and you can get away with a five to an eight weight rod for those. Uh, for the large mouth in the lakes, um, I've always had really good luck using top water poppers um, and fishing that uh, the edges of the mill foil or the weed, wine, weed lines. Um, uh, especially at dusk. They go nuts for big poppers at dusk. Uh, my favorite time for these guys is June through September. Um, uh, usually that's when the water warms up enough for them to be really consistent uh, at biting flies in shallow water. Uh, good spot for largies in uh, the metro would be Lake Phelan over in St. Paul. Uh, and the Mississippi River for smallies uh, right through downtown. Any of the riprap, find rocks on the river, um, there will be smallies. Our pike and muskies, uh, we've got quite a few pike in our lakes, uh, a little bit lower abundance of muskies in our lakes. Uh, believe it or not, we do also get them in our smaller creeks like Bassett and Minnehaha. Um, especially muskies. I've seen quite a few large muskies that I believe probably get blown in from uh, Gray's Dam. Um, they obviously spread out through, through uh, high water time. Um, when uh, typical, you know, if you're going to the Chippewa River in Wisconsin or something, uh, large streamers, big bucktail streamers or large poppers, uh, you will need at least an eight to a 10 weight for the pike and a uh, 10 to a 12 for those muskies. Um, uh, sinking line is preferred for these guys uh, in the lakes. Um, if you're targeting them in the creeks, um, you can size down your streamers. I would use like a six or an eight inch streamer um, and you can use floating line with them. Um, it's fun in Minnehaha, it's almost, uh, I mean, it is, uh, uh, like sight fishing for these huge predatory fish in the deeper back eddies in some sections. Uh, we need to pray for more rain though. The creek is very, very low this year, um, almost non-fishable. Uh, best time for these guys is right away in the spring to early summer, take a break mid-summer that gets too warm for them in the lakes and then they start up good again in September to October. Uh, my favorite spot for pike is Pickerel Lake right by Lilydale. Uh, that's a good oxbow lake. So when the river floods, a lot of those river fish will get trapped in that lake once the water recedes. Um, and it just produces a bunch of big pike. There's very good um, weed growth in there. Uh, and then also Bidet Makaska uh, or Lake Calhoun. I call it the Ska for short. Uh, it's very good for muskies. And um, I think at one time, uh, I believe the state record muskie actually came out of the ska, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you have questions along the way, just a reminder, feel free to put them into the chat. Well, I'll try to hit them at the end. Uh, so these are our primary game fish. Um, uh, some of the strategies that work best for these guys, and this is a real generalization for these. Um, I don't want to spend a ton of time on them because uh, uh, I want to get to the other interesting species, but for the lakes, um, target weed lines and drop offs. Um, so most of our urban lakes are also um, dealing with milfoil. There's a whole bunch of milfoil in them, uh, which is an aquatic plant uh, that's relatively invasive. Um, uh, a lot of boaters do not like milfoil. Um, a lot of bass fishermen love milfoil because it creates awesome largemouth bass habitat. So double-edged sword as is most things. Um, but target those weed lines, uh, both shallow and deep. Um, and if you're able to find a good drop off, especially if you can wade out on a sandbar, um, cast off that uh, towards the deep water and pull it back in shallow or cast parallel along that drop, um, that is a good place for predator fish to ambush. Uh, best times on the lake, dawn or dusk. Um, if you're fishing midday or on a hot sunny day, try to find those shade lines under trees up in shallow. Um, that's always a good bet. Uh, my favorite flies, good old woolly bugger, catches everything. 
uh, clousers are great. And then midsummer, you will see a whole bunch of damselflies hatching. Uh, so I love using various sizes of blue poppers to mimic those. Uh, in the big river and in the creeks, I love to, it's very trout fishing. We'll target those current seams and we'll fish the deep water transition spots like the pools into the riffles and runs. Um, and then obviously any structure like rocks or logs, um, et cetera. Uh, best times down or dusk, midday works, just find the shade. Um, my favorite flies would be the Murdich minnow, which is a good bait fish pattern, a tequili, which is a classic uh, crayfish pattern, and then various foam poppers as well. Uh, all right, so we're moving out of uh, the run of the mill game species and we are going to go into the uncommon game species. I don't like the term rough fish really. Uh, I prefer the uncommon game species because all fish put up a good fight when you hook them. Uh, so a rough fish is a term used by some uh, agencies uh, to describe less desirable fish to sport anglers. Um, these fish are usually big. They usually don't look pretty um, and they people usually don't like to eat them. Uh, so um, rough fish is even a polite term for uh, trash fish, which uh, many folks might associate with some of these species. Uh, but I am gonna uh, uh, try and change your mind on some of those things tonight and um, get you some strategies to use to catch a lot of these species. So we'll start off with my personal favorite. That's right, the world's largest minnow, the common carp. Uh, these guys are uh, were introduced to uh, the states at the same time as brown trout uh, in the late 1800s, early 19. Um, they were used mainly for a food source for, for uh, settlers. Um, they're also a coveted game fish in Europe um, and are to this day. Um, these guys now get a pretty bad rap. Uh, they, they can cause uh, damage to watersheds if there are too many of them, uh, but we see the same thing when we get too many brown trout in a brookie stream as well. Um, so any introduced species is going to cause some sort of damage. Um, a lot of these, th this species in particular, the common carp, can survive in very low oxygen levels of dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, and they can uh, survive in very high temperatures. Um, so basically they're the only fish that can survive in some of the water conditions that we see um, in very depleted watersheds, uh, uh, ecologically speaking, um, uh, which also I feel contributes a lot to their um, uh, 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 distaste by anglers. Um, they're super fun to catch though, and I will explain why. Uh, believe it or not, these guys primarily eat uh, aquatic plants and small macroinvertebrates. So think your run of the mill, mayfly nymphs, damselfly nymphs, um, crayfish, things like that. Uh, so they're grubbing stuff off the bottom for the most part of their diet. Uh, very soon we will get the cottonwood uh, seed hatch and we will start seeing more of these fish slurp uh, dry flies, which is very fun. Uh, they are the hardest fighting fish in Minnesota, hands down. Uh, these guys do not build up lactic acid uh, very quickly at all. Like a lot of our other species, they'll fight for a little bit. Uh, the lactic acid will uh, concentrate in the muscles and they'll stop fighting. These fish will not stop. Uh, in fact, the picture you're looking at is my largest carp yet. Uh, that is between a 25 and 30 pound carp. Uh, I caught it right below the Stone Arch Bridge. I hooked it way up in the head of the channels on the northeast side, and it ran me uh, underneath the bridge into the main current of the river, uh, and I was using a six weight. Um, and I was literally chasing this guy, uh, precariously wading uh, towards the main current of the Mississippi, which you don't usually want to do. Um, and, you know, he was into my backing. I could see the reel through my backing. I mean, look at that guy's tail. It's as big as my freaking head. Uh, they are just very, very impressive fish. Um, uh, uh, my grandpa would always give me heck for, for fishing for these guys, though. He'd be like, you, you, you know, uh, he gives me crap for 
doing catch and release in general. He never really understood that uh, why we let them go. Uh, but these species are classified in the DNR as a managed invasive species, uh, which basically means um, that the, the state knows how to get rid of them. Um, so it is okay to put them back into the same water you caught them from. Um, if you are going to keep them uh, or dispose of them, don't just throw them on the bank. Um, that, that is actually illegal to just waste your catch. Um, so bring them home in the very least, chop them up. They are uh, fantastic for tomato plants. Um, I get a lot of Eastern European immigrants uh, come up to me while I'm fishing downtown. They'll ask me if I'm eating them and I say, heck no. Uh, but they always looked at me really surprised. Uh, and apparently the secret is you have to let them swim in a kiddie pool of either buttermilk or distilled water uh, for up to three days to detox. And then you cut them into large steaks and smoke them. And apparently they're super good. Um, I've not tried this. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it with a large carp, but if you catch a smaller one, two to five pounds, it might be pretty good. I don't know. Uh, if you've ever eaten carp, let me know. <laughs> uh, so why fly fish for them? Um, so uh, I, I recently had a guide trip with a returning client of mine, and uh, he's actually pictured in the top left uh, corner there. Uh, and he said, um, what changed the perception for him of, of carp is uh, not thinking of them as trash fish, but actually thinking of them as a game fish. Um, because when you switch that perception of these of this species, they are one of the most challenging fish to hook on the fly. Um, reasons being that it is all sight fishing. We cannot really blind cast to these fish. Uh, so we are doing a lot of flat style spot and stock uh, waiting. Uh, we are watching their behaviors um, and we, we see a lot of them. Uh, we end up spooking most of them. Um, and when we do connect, it's pretty dang cool. I'll go into more of the details of them in a little bit here. Uh, it's also low pressure, no crowds. Trust me, uh, <laughs> if, I, if I ever see another person uh, carp fishing in one of my spots, I'm like, I'm not mad, I'm just surprised. <laughs> and usually they're some of the folks that I see routinely in the shop or uh, that I've guided before. Um, so for this presentation, I actually asked, I did a big social media shout out for people in our community who do fish for these species to send me their pictures. Uh, so uh, throughout this presentation, uh, especially at this point on, you're going to see mostly photos from other amazing local anglers uh, with the fish they catch. Um, these fish get huge too, carp get very big. I believe the state record is 60 pounds. Um, and like I mentioned before, they don't build up that lactic acid super quick. Uh, so they will fight uh, for a super long time and you uh, more often than not will see your backing, uh, which uh, for as a, a Midwestern uh, uh, fly angler, that is that is something impressive to see. So strategies for these guys, they are pretty unique. Um, like I mentioned before, we're going to target mud flats or sandbars, uh, weed lines and lakes um, along uh, sunken logs or riprap banks on the river. Uh, if you are fishing in the river, we like to find areas where the main current isn't flowing super fast. Uh, slower areas like flooded backwaters or ponds. Um, these guys are funny. They, they're okay with fishing or with sitting in fast currents and they'll be feeding in that fast current, but they're not feeding in current like trout do. They are uh, uh, stuck to the bottom, slurping stuff up from the bottom for the most part. So it is uh, in fast current, it's nearly impossible for us to catch them. So we like to target them in the slower areas. Um, this is kind of the double-edged sword of this species though. They also have one of the largest and most sensitive lateral lines, uh, which is a fish's sensory organ um, of any freshwater species. Uh, so stealth and accuracy is key for these uh, fish. Um, most of the time we aren't doing uh, your run of the mill overhead cast or even roll casting. Um, primarily what we're doing is uh, a drag and drop cast. Uh, so when we finally do see a feeding fish, we don't want to just land our fly uh, directly on their head. We actually cast past them 
uh, and drag uh, or fly into there. They have a little feeding zone about 10 inches around their head. Uh, we drag our fly with our rod tip into that zone and let it drop. We really don't do any stripping. We just let it sit there. Um, and then it's uh, a visual game and a waiting game at that point as well. Um, these fish also exhibit a lot of different behaviors and people get frustrated fly fishing for them because unlike trout, these guys literally do whatever they want. They do, they feed randomly. Uh, they'll stop feeding randomly. They'll be one spot one day and they'll be a different spot the next. Um, they're really, really interesting fish to target. Uh, but if you're at a spot and you see a, carp, a single carp or multiple carp swimming by, speeding by really fast, uh, don't waste your cast. Uh, we don't want to spook them, just let them go. If you see a, a basking fish or one that's just sitting still, they'll generally be right below the surface of the water. Uh, those fish are just warming up uh, in the sunlight generally. Um, you've got a 50-50% chance, uh, chance of uh, having that fish eat. Most of the time, we'll just spook them. Um, if, the, the, if you also see fish that are spawning, which are the ones that leap out of the water, um, uh, don't waste your shot on those as well. Uh, they've got other things on their mind. The ones that we do want to look for are really slow cruisers, either a single or in a group. Um, they'll be swimming very slowly, kind of munching on things as they go or there's a classic tailing feeder, uh, which if you've ever seen a redfish uh, tailing video, uh, carp do the same exact thing. They all put their head in the mud, their tail up in the air. Uh, we'll see a big mud cloud. Uh, that, is, that, that is like, uh, in, in trout terms, uh, that would be like hitting the perfect caddis hatch or something. Uh, finding a feeding carp is really cool um, and our best, uh, best chance of hooking a fish. Uh, so that's a little about carp. If you got questions, let me know. Uh, some other minnow family fish that are really fun to catch and kind of uh, uncommon for us to do so would be chubs and shiners. Uh, these fish are native. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them, especially in the ponds and the creeks and a few in the large river. Um, when I was a kid, uh, Minnehaha Creek was just a few blocks down from my road, uh, down the road from my house. And uh, my friends and I would use um, trout nugget power bait, those stinky marshmallows. And we would just catch a whole bunch of chubs. Some of them would be really nice sized as well. Um, uh, I think the largest I've ever caught is like a 12 or a 13 inch chub. Uh, they're actually really pretty. The males, you can kind of see it in the top picture there is the chub. Uh, the males, when they spawn, will grow uh, horns on the top of their head and they actually use those knobs or the horns on the top of their head to roll rocks around to make their nest. Uh, so unlike some species like bass or trout that use their tail to clear a red, uh, chubs use their head, which is kind of cool. Um, shiners are, are a common bait species for catching pike and other things, uh, but they're, if you have a one to a three weight, it is super fun micro fishing for them. Um, there's there's a, a, red, a, red, a, a whole bunch of them out there. Um, best, best thing I've, I've found to catch them fly-wise uh, would be small zebra midges for the most part. Uh, the sucker family, uh, especially this species, has gotten a lot more attention lately. Um, so uh, the, the uh, suckers are different than the carp. Carp are in the minnow family. A sucker is technically a different family of fish, um, most notably being the big and smallmouth buffalo. Uh, we get a whole bunch of these guys in the uh, Mississippi River through downtown. Um, and the lower, below the falls at Minnehaha, we'll get some running up there as well. Uh, but these are our native, quote, carp species. Um, uh, they've been uh, in the news in the, over the past few years because they are our native species. Uh, these guys help um, uh, take care of zebra mussel populations. Um, and they've also been targeted heavily by uh, bow fishermen. Um, and we're finding out that it's not because uh, it, people just don't know the difference between them. Uh, it looks like a carp. It must be a carp. Let's get rid of it. Um, and that's a very, uh, uh, has been a pretty destructive uh, mentality on this species. Um, there's a recent uh, study conducted by a fisheries biologist up in the Detroit Lakes area 
um, trying to uh, add some, some credibility to the species. Um, and he's been um, studying their, their uh, lifespan, um, seeing how long these fish are in a system. And the oldest fish that was recorded was 112 years old. So just fantastic fish. Uh, they get huge as well. Um, and I personally believe these guys are harder than, to catch than even carp and carp are up there. Uh, the funny thing about buffalo is that for the most part, they're filter feeders. Um, so you will see them sitting in the middle of the water column with their mouths open. Uh, they're not chugging, uh, munching on stuff. They're just open. They're sucking in algae um, and other, uh, other very small organisms. Um, they're not really feeding on uh, for the most part, they're not feeding on large tangible things that we can imitate with a fly, um, unless you can figure out a good algae glob fly, maybe that would work. Um, every once in a while, you will see them grubbing on the bottom like a carp. Um, you will also see them very, very often, uh, especially when those uh, cottonwood seeds are out, um, you will see them feeding on the surface. Um, the bottom picture, of the little kid holding a buffalo. That was actually just this past weekend. Uh, we were fishing on the mill ruin side of the Stone Arch Bridge, and there's a huge trash patch of duckweed and all the litter uh, right below um, where a storm sewer pulls in. And we were rolled up there, and there were, there were probably 30 uh, 10 to 30 pound buffalo slurping up this sludge <laughs> right below the sewer. Um, and we were actually uh, able to um, just place our flies, uh, again, really untraditional fly casting methods, but we basically casted our, our flies on top of the scuzz and tried to drag it uh, over to their mouths um, and let them, you know, they kind of have a feeding line that they go on. Uh, very often it's pretty random. Uh, both carp and buffalo can't see in front of their heads too well. Um, so they feed dry flies very randomly. Um, but this kid's eight years old. He hooked this beautiful buffalo that's probably at least 10, 20 years old. Um, and it weighed about as much as he did too. That's no, those smiles say it all. Uh, so a very fun species, super challenging um, and a great native species at that. Some other suckers um, that are pretty cool to see. Um, my probably one of my favorites um, is the quillback carp sucker. Uh, we call them quillback for short, and I equate them to being the freshwater permit. Uh, one because of that sweet dorsal fin there. Um, also because they are similar with with buffalo, where they are primarily filter feeders, um, and sometimes they'll be grubbing on small macros on the bottom. Um, they also are very spooky fish, uh, so if you plunk a fly, I've found if you plunk a fly too close to them, usually they'll spook and they won't come back. Um, so they're a cool species. We've got a whole bunch of them in, in uh, our Mississippi lower, lower um, Minnehaha, Nine Mile Creek in Bloomington, um, uh, up right above the Minnesota River. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of them. They're very cool. Uh, keep things, keep those flies small, though. That has seemed to be the ticket with those guys. Um, a common species of sucker that you might also see in a few of the trout streams. Um, primarily, they're more of a warm water species, but uh, red horse, uh, they're beautiful. They have just really um, bright red colored fins. Um, uh, we've got a whole bunch of them in the Mississippi in the lower Minnehaha. Uh, they're also very challenging to hook. They don't feed out of the currents. They, they hold in fast water, uh, but they don't feed in the current like trout do. Uh, they're planted on the bottom. So it's kind of a weird mix of using a fly that won't get snagged, um, but also won't drift too fast. Um, so I've, I've used a lot of smaller nymphs with larger tungsten beads uh, to catch those guys. Uh, catfish drum and temperate bass. Uh, these are a, a good menagerie of other species that we catch commonly. Uh, the channel catfish is probably the most readily fly caught catfish species. Um, you will also catch bullhead from time to time in ponds and lakes. Uh, but when we're fishing in the big river, um, the channel cats are the way to go. Uh, they, uh, I've, I've, I've kind of accidentally caught a lot of catfish trying to go for carp. Um, often what we're, all we can see in the Mississippi 
uh, through the through the downtowns is is bubbles coming up. Um, so some you do you basically cast towards a line of bubbles and you slowly strip your streamer or nymph through there. Um, and you know, uh, probably nine out of ten times it's a carp. Um, uh, well, I would say most of the time it's either a turtle or a carp. <laughs> uh, and then sometimes you'll we'll haul in really good sized catfish too. Um, larger streamers. Um, I've also had luck on like really large um, uh, crayfish patterns as well. Uh, larger stonefly nymphs seem to work. I don't think that's the other great thing about these species. That I don't think they're too picky about the fly. Um, it's really just about getting it close to them. Uh, the freshwater drum. These guys are super cool. Uh, they fight really hard. Uh, this species has a lateral line. It's one of the only species that has this. Uh, it has a lateral line that goes all the way to the end of the tail fin. Most uh, fish's lateral lines end at the where the tail starts. Uh, this guy uh, has a line that goes all the way through the tail. So very well adapted to, to fishing in uh, dark uh, waters, grubbing stuff on the bottom. Uh, we get a whole bunch of them in the Mississippi, especially in Pool 2, which is Ford Dam to Hastings. Um, uh, I've done best kind of, uh, again, going for carp, casting to bubbles, uh, slowly stripping streamers or larger nymphs, uh, crayfish patterns. Um, that's, that's what I've done really well on. Uh, they're called drum because they do produce some pretty cool grunting sounds. Uh, they and they they rub tendons along their swim bladder and it creates uh, these grunting sounds, which is pretty cool. Um, white bass are really fun. They're getting more popular now, which is cool to see. Uh, but we've I've I've had best luck on them uh, in pool two on the Mississippi. Uh, you might be able to find them in the lower Minnesota as well. Um, but Pike Island and Fort Snelling State Park, right where the two rivers come together. Um, is a generally a, a pretty fail safe spot to find these guys. And these ones are fun because they are actively chasing bait balls of, of minnows. Um, so if you uh, see fish uh, kind of hitting a bunch of stuff at the surface, uh, throw any you know generic white or silver bait fish pattern in there and strip it as fast as you can to keep it near the top. Um, and you'll probably end up hauling in a nice white bass. So super cool fish. Uh, we don't we don't see that kind of behavior a lot uh, with our other species. Uh, these guys are super cool. The living dinosaurs. We've got two living dinosaur species left: uh, the bowfin um, and the gar. Both the long and the short nose. So bowfin um, live in really shallow marshy ponds or bays or backwaters. Um, uh, basically what makes these guys dinosaurs is they both have real uh, primitive lungs and they're able to actually swim up and gulp air. Uh, so we find these guys uh, in very, very, uh, uh, very shallow marshy areas with low dissolved uh, oxygen levels. Um, the marshier, the better, honestly. Uh, I've, I've only caught bowfin uh, while blind casting. Um, uh, going for other species like bass or something. Um, I've also uh, like wading around this, a lot of the streams and rivers uh, in the area looking for carp. I've just rolled up on them um, sitting there. So spotting and stalking has seemed to work, uh, especially when implemented with the drag and drop cast where you just kind of plop it uh, past them and drag it past their face. Uh, they seem pretty dang territorial. Um, in the springtime, the males turn a really cool neon green color. Uh, so it looks like they're kind of radioactive, but that's uh, their, their spawning color, which is neat to see. Uh, the females will um, uh, uh, guard their young. So they will have just thousands of young fry. Um, you'll see a little black cloud of these small wiggly fry. Um, and in the, in the bottom of it or in the back of it will be this big mama bowfin. So that's kind of cool to see in the uh, middle summer. Um, the gar, uh, these guys, I've, I've seen a lot in the lower Mississippi, more towards Hastings, um, as well as uh, the Minnesota River through the, uh, the refuge there. Um, I've found them mostly in the big, slow eddies on bends. Uh, there's usually a lot of down trees in them. Um, 
I've also found them uh, pretty readily in creek mouths. Uh, and I would assume that's because they are uh, pretty ferocious uh, minnow eaters. Uh, the minnows are probably swimming in or out of that creek um, and they're staging up below those areas to take out the minnows. Um, these guys have a really long, narrow, bony mouth. Uh, so traditional hooks do not hook them very well. Um, what has worked for a lot of folks who have um, been targeting these uh, is a rope fly and essentially uh, it's some nylon that's strung through a uh, metal ring or something, an O-ring, uh, wrapped it, shred it up, uh, unravel it, shred it up, and then tie it, tie it on there, put some super glue on there. And essentially, there, there is no hook in that thing. What happens is when they grasp those fibers uh, and they turn their head, all, that, all those fibers will tangle in their mouth and around their mouth. Um, so you basically just uh, lasso them uh and haul them in but they are really cool fish um uh, these guys also uh, especially the gar they're, they're another one that gets a, some bad raps as being a trash fish but uh, just knowing their natural history is just fascinating these are truly living dinosaurs uh, so uh those are some of the species that you can target uh that was what you know maybe 20 of them uh and there's a thousand more to go so don't don't uh, limit yourself. The possibilities are endless to what we can catch here. Um, so now I'll tell you a little bit of how to find fishing spots in the metro. Um, I might share a couple more spots with you and then we'll go into questions. Uh, so where should I fish? Uh, we have a lot of water um, everywhere, which is amazing um, for, for a relatively densely populated area like we live in. Um, so uh, I would recommend you start near your home or work or, um, and if there's a pond or a creek or a lake near where you readily are, uh, bring your fishing gear one day and you will probably be pretty dang surprised what you'll, what you'll catch out of it. Um, like I said, even the marshy stuff will probably have um, uh, those bowfin or some panfish or some largemouth or some carp. Um, uh, there's, there's fish everywhere. Uh, so, so get out and explore first and foremost, uh, but also use your resources and do some research. Uh, my favorite resources to find new spots is obviously Google Maps. Uh, my, my wife can attest to this. My favorite hobby, if I'm not on the water, is to sit on Google Maps and just follow streams and lakes and ponds around um, and look for little access points. And uh, that has been a super fun and successful way of finding fishing spots for me. Uh, the Minnesota DNR has some fantastic info out there, both on their recreation compass, um, and I more readily use the Lake Finder app. Um, and the Lake Finder app is basically a, a database full of the fisheries surveys uh, that the DNR conduct, conducts on all of our river, uh, not rivers, but lakes. Um, so click around on the, you know, I usually find a lake on Google. Uh, I'll plug it into the lake finder and I'll see uh, uh, what kind of fish are swimming around in there. If it looks like uh, some interesting uh, populations, um, especially larger or good numbers of specific species, I'll definitely check it out. If you're going to a state water trail, say like the Rum River or the Mississippi, uh, the, the DNR also has water trail maps and it will point out access points uh, which are also great areas for you to hop in and wade, usually, um, if you don't have a boat. Uh, and I also peruse the interweb um, and go to old forums. Forums aren't much of a thing anymore since Facebook has gotten around, uh, but the internet never dies. So all that info is still on there from years past. I really like the in-depth outdoors forum. Uh, and then uh, there's a Fishing Minnesota uh, forum out there as well. Uh, so great resources, easy to use, um, full of info. Uh, so once you get to your spot, uh, here's a few things you should look for. The perfect spot needs public access. Number one, uh, that should be a park, a trail, or a road bridge. Um, if, it, uh, if it doesn't have one of those things in the metro, you're probably going through someone's backyard. I really don't know if a lot of city folk would be mad about it. They'd mostly probably be surprised. 
Uh, but legally, I have to tell you to keep your feet wet if you're going through uh, private private land. Um, so uh, try to access from a public public place. Um, if you're fishing in a stream or a river, you want to have some sort of aeration getting in there, uh, typically either from a, some sort of drain, uh, a rapids or a waterfall. Um, all that aeration is what creates bugs, and most of these species will eat bugs, um, or uh, the food chain will go up from there. So uh, finding the areas with some aeration um, is a great place to start. Uh, if you're specifically targeting uh, more predatory fish or uh, things like carp, targeting flats, sandbars, drop-offs, uh, weed lines, all those sorts of areas are kill zones uh, for those predatory fish. They are ambush predators. Um, they like using that depth change and those, that sort of structure to ambush their prey. Um, again, if you're fishing creeks or or the river, um, side channels and pools. A lot of these species like can hang out in fast water, um, but it's hard for us to catch them there. Uh, they will also hang out in the slower areas uh, because they're 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 lazy like the rest of us. Uh, they'd rather eat food easily. So um, finding these slower moving areas is a great place to target them with a fly. And then obviously structure. These fish want something to hide by. Um, as does their prey. So finding rocks, trees, or man-made structure um, is a great indication that there's probably going to be some sort of fish in there. Uh, so other things to know that I think are pretty cool about our urban waterways. Uh, we have a 72 mile long national park right through uh, both metro areas, and that is the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. Uh, starts in uh, Coon Rapids and goes all the way to Hastings. Um, I, I frequently fish the section from 694 to Boom Island. Uh, there's fantastic smallmouth bass fishing through there, as well as uh, all the other um, uncommon species. So uh, Pool 2, uh, below Ford Dam and down to Hastings, uh, that area is open to year-round catch and release fishing for walleye, sauger, and large and smallmouth bass. I think at one time pike were also on there, but I don't believe they're on there anymore. So uh, for sure, walleye, uh, sauger, and the bass species. Um, and then all those uncommon species are open year-round as well. Um, let's see, access lock, like I mentioned, keep your feet wet through private property on streams, uh, enter from a legal access point, um, if you're on a lake, uh, uh, try to have a boat if you want to venture too far. Uh, lakes are different access kind of laws than streams are. Um, if nothing else, ask the landowner. More than anything, they will likely say yes, just because they're uh, excited to learn more uh, and just want to see somebody doing it. So um, a lot of the lakes in the metro area are electric motors only. So if you do have a boat, um, make sure you're only using your trolling motor on a few of them. Um, and we do obviously have some aquatic invasive species and a lot of pollution. Uh, so make sure you're cleaning your gear before and after getting in and out of that water. Uh, pick up as much trash as you can. And uh, more often than not, you'll get a big crowd watching you. So take some time. Uh, if someone walks up, educate them. Uh, all of our water is shared. Why not try and make a new conservation advocate? Uh, so that's all I've got for that. Thank you very much for listening. Um, if you're interested in exploring some of your urban waters, uh, give me a call. Uh, let's book an urban adventure together. My number is 612-293-8058. Uh, better yet, you can just shoot me an email at guide at bobmitchellsflyshop.com. Um, I've been fishing this water since I was a kid. I absolutely love it, and I love sharing it with other folks even more. So I will go ahead and unshare my screen, and I'd be happy to answer some questions for you. Thank you, Evan. This was a terrific presentation. I'm not exactly sure where to start here, but fortunately, there are some other people who... Uh, have good have asked some good questions. So uh, the first question is from Eve, and his question is, where can I safely wade fish for smallmouth bass in the Mississippi River? 
Uh, great question. Um, wading the Mississippi through downtown is risky business. Um, there is a, a huge dredge section uh, for the old barge traffic. So ideally, we don't want to go too far into that river. Um, uh, there's some shore fishing access areas I found would be um, uh, East River Flats. Um, as well as uh, whatever that park is directly across. The name is escaping me right now. Um, there's also the Stone Arch Bridge area and upstream from the bridge on the west side of the river, the, the bike path follows it directly right along the water. And there's a few areas where the steps go in. Um, those areas are super fun to wade fish all the way up to Boom Island. Um, and uh, there's a new park on the directly upstream of Boom Island now. Um, find areas, I would say, that you can fish from shore versus in the water, in the, in the river. Um, that will be better for you. I've seen uh, some guy wading out um, somewhere near the Ford Dam. I was on the 46th Street Bridge and there seemed to be a sandbar. Is that down, downstream from that? Yeah, so that's probably somewhere along, uh, it's probably lower down towards the mouth of Minnehaha Creek. Um, it kind of changes from year to year, depending on how the flooding is. Uh, but there, yes, there's generally a sandbar somewhere around that creek mouth that you can venture out on. Um, on the riprap bank between Minnehaha up to Ford Dam, uh, there's some really cool pike spots up there. Um, there's some good eddies right along shore that you can uh, sometimes get some big pike out of. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Rob Cress. I should mention Dave Miller had the same question as Eve. Um, Rob Cress asks, do you typically fish the lakes from a boat? Mm, good question. Um, for the majority of my fishing lifetime, which has been my whole life up until now, uh, I did not have a boat to fish from. Uh, so most of my lake fishing has been waiting. Um, if you have access to a canoe or a kayak, that's a fantastic way to get into uh, the far side of the weed edge. Um, for the most part though, I've been very successful finding a sandbar or an area where I can get off the bank a little bit um, and casting towards that uh, either right along parallel with the shore um, or out to that close weed edge. Um, so you definitely do not always need a boat. It definitely, there's, there's, I always like to, uh, tell folks, uh, when you're watching a boat angler and a shore angler, watch where they're casting. A boat angler is going to try to cast as close to the bank as possible. A shore angler is going to try to cast as far out as possible. So all those fish are somewhere in between. <laughs> That's a really good point. Uh, here's an interesting question from Cody. As an angler, what is your opinion of municipalities trying to mitigate or remove carp populations? Do you think they do a good job managing the population or are they decimating potential carp fisheries? Fantastic question. Uh, and I have to be careful because I'm on the uh, Trout Unlimited board uh, but I feel like there should be a carp unlimited someday. That'd be pretty hilarious. Uh, but um, yes, that's kind of a weird thing uh, when we're fishing for, for carp, especially. Um, they are actively being removed out of many, many watersheds. Um, uh, what, what I have found is that uh, when they do remove a lot of these, a lot of those fish, it usually happens in the winter. Um, all the carp will group together in the deepest areas of a lake. They will drop nets down through the ice and then haul them out uh, through the ice. Um, uh, so uh, every year for me as a guide for these species, I have to be constantly looking for new spots because I never know when they're going to be pulling out these fish. Um, I will say they don't catch all of them. <laughs> uh, these species are very good at uh, surviving. Um, as we as we can see. Um, uh, so what will generally happen after a netting is you will see less numbers of them, uh, but you will generally see a few larger ones left. Um, and you know they don't do this every year in a lot of areas. 
Um, so, uh, you know, they, the population will rebound after a while, but, um, yeah, that is kind of a nuance, a weird nuance, uh, where trouts were trying to promote habitat, um, and promote more population. And with a lot of these species, they're actively being taken out, um, whether that's good or bad, uh, if there are too many carp in a watershed, uh, they do contribute to lower water, uh, clarity and quality. Uh, because they grub up things from the bottom, they are uh, uprooting aquatic plants and they are um, stirring up uh, silt and releasing a lot of the nutrients from the bottom of the lake. So like any species, if there's too many of one thing, it can cause issues. Um, uh, it should be a healthy balance. Um, the clear, the clear uh, decimation of carp, I don't think um, is, a for, uh, is, is ever going to happen though. <laughs> Okay, thank you. It's it carp sound a lot like the still water version of brown trout. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the poor man's bonefish too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when we had uh, Casey from the Wisconsin DNR on a, uh, last month, she talked about some of the uh, things they're doing to electro electroshock brown trout out of brook trout streams and relocate them in uh, in different waters. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. I uh, quote. A question from Jim Souter. Do you ever target carp during their spawning season? Uh, yes, um, that's one of my favorite times to, to target them. Um, usually because all of the places where they live are very flooded generally. This spring is not the case because uh, we've had such a dry spring. Um, but generally when they're spawning, it's when everything is flooded. Uh, so all the, uh, what, essentially what that means for us as fly anglers is that they're very easy to access. Uh, and we can, uh, uh, one of my favorite places um, is where uh, Minnehaha flows into uh, Nokomis. Um, if Minnehaha ever gets over uh, 400 CFS, uh, the lake and the river will start to flood over uh, the walking trails. And it's a very cool uh, fly fishing opportunity to hook into 20 and 30 pound carp uh, from a bike path. <laughs> um, so that's, that's pretty dang good. Their backs are out of the water and they're actively just feeding off of worms on the, you know, their heads are out of the water. It's, it's really dang cool. Um, if, you act, if you see carp that are actively spawning though, like the ones that are splashing like crazy and bumping into each other or jumping out of the water, uh, those fish are not actively feeding. Uh, so you do want to find the carp that are uh, head down, tail up. Um, those are the, the fish you wanna key in on. Okay, uh, this is more a comment than a question, but I think it's kind of cool, so I'm gonna read it. Mm -hmm. uh, from Gerald Reimer. He says, my grandfather sold sm smoked carp door to door. Really? Oh, that's awesome. That's, <laughs> that's totally, yeah. They were, they were uh, a food fish um, uh, for, for growing, growing towns. Uh, so yeah, I'd believe it, but it's kind of a mind blowing thing for us at this point to hear that. <laughs> yeah. So he thinks that smoked carp don't taste any better than smoked salmon. Hey, so. there you go. Yep. I guess I guess we'll have to get his recipe. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. That's cool, huh? Okay, here's a question from Donnell. What is the best time of day for carp and what kind of flies to use? Great. Um, carp are, uh, carp do whatever the heck they want. Um, I have not found anything super consistent as far as timing, um, as far as conditions and things like that. Um, uh, there's still a new species to target on the fly. So maybe as uh, we progress uh, chasing them, uh, we'll, we'll keep learning more. But in my experience, um, the best times that I've generally seen carp are between uh, feeding is between uh, 9 and uh, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, after that, it seems like they take a big long nap and then right before dark, they'll get active again. Um, so that's kind of been the pattern, but you'll see them feeding randomly all the time. Um, so if you, if you go after work or if you go for lunch, you'll, you'll probably see carp feeding. That's a great question. Okay, the next question is from Cody, kind of related to the last question. 
Do carp anglers actually use Cheerio flies? <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, so I can, uh, my favorite carp fly uh, is a small olive woolly bugger. Uh, just like it probably is for most of the trout anglers here, and you know it, a woolly bugger will catch anything, anywhere, if you have it in the right size. Um, I've caught that 30 pound fish that I showed earlier on, uh, that fish came on a small woolly bugger. <laughs> wow. uh, uh, for the most part, the fly doesn't matter too much. Uh, they seem to like patterns with rubber legs. Um, ideally, we like to use patterns that ride hook point up because we need them actively sitting on the bottom. So that helps us um, not get snagged as often. Uh, one pattern that you can look up and is very successful for me and most carp folk uh, is uh, John Montana's hybrid nymph. And basically that is a soft hackle nymph with a San Juan worm tail and big dumbbell eyes uh, right behind the hook eye. Um, so that's been uh, my version of it. I call the sewer rat. I tie it with light pink uh, San Juan worm tail, uh, dark brown dubbing and uh, usually grizzly hackle for the, for the collar. So, um, so uh, yes, it generally uh, between size uh, 10 to six, I've, I've had luck on. Um, locally, a, a favorite for a lot of carp anglers here is um, yellow uh, yarn eggs or foam eggs. Um, uh, so raid your steel heading box of yellow eggs and they'll probably catch a bunch of carp locally as well. Sounds great. I'm gonna be looking for that sewer rat in the Orvis catalog. Oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, here's a question from Brian Tucker. Uh, do you have a rule of thumb for ruling out a stream as being too small to hold fish? Sure. Um, if it is an intermittent stream, meaning that it only flows after rainfall or snow melt, there's probably not fish in there. Um, uh, we don't have a lot of super tiny streams right in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, most of those have, are either now run underground um, or directly uh, diverted straight into the larger streams like Bassett, um, uh, Shingle, or Minnehaha. Um, so I would focus for sure on those because it's year-round flow and there's some good uh, meandering habitat left on those with some riffle run pool type structure. Um, and just like trout, all fish love that uh, uh, for, for stream habitat. So yeah. Um, uh, if it's super tiny and it would be really annoying to cast a fly rod in it, I would say just skip it and go somewhere else. We've got enough water, so. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, here's a question from Dave. On the Mississippi, any good wade or shore fishing up closer to 694? Um, that area gets a little harder. Um, uh, above 694, a really great wading area uh, is Coon Rapids Dam. Uh, there's two regional parks there on the Hennepin and Anoka County side. Um, there's uh, the, the river channel is pretty shallow, rocky, um, and it braids quite a bit. There's a few islands. Um, my pro tip for that spot, if you wade even just one channel over and fish off the island, you will have it to yourself. Um, but we see everything up, every, every river fish is up there, but especially smallmouth. Um, uh, and I've done pretty well on carp up there as well. Uh, the tricky thing from Boom Island to 694 is it's very uh, de uh, developed. There's a lot of industrial development there. Um, the banks are all basically vertical riprap. Um, and it's so access in between boom and 694 is kind of difficult. There's a few sneaky spots uh, that you can find on the bike trails, uh, but Coon Rapids Dam would probably be uh, my go-to spot. There's also Manomin Park in Fridley, uh, which is just down the road from my house. Um, that's where Rice Creek dumps in. Um, and I've seen a lot of people catch good catfish out of there, believe it or not, um, but carp and bass as well, so. Uh, those are a couple uh, north of, of 694 spots. Okay, and here is a question from Michelle. Uh, do you use a steel leader? Uh, I will for the, if I'm directly um, targeting the toothy fish, 
um, especially the pike and the muskies. Uh, uh, below Ford Dam, you'll hook into um, walleye with a fly fairly often, and they, they have some pokey teeth as well. Um, so generally, um, if, you're, if you're using a minnow pattern, a larger minnow pattern, I would tie some wire leader on there for sure. Um, wire will spook bass pretty often. Um, it will definitely spook carp and a lot of those other uncommon bottom grubbers. So um, uh, tippet size, leader size for, for say a carp, I like to use a 1X, um, a nine foot 1X leader for carp. Um, that seems to be good enough. And that works for bass and other species as well. Okay, very helpful. Okay, there right now there aren't any more questions in the chat. I'll give uh, things a couple of minutes in case uh, anybody has any final questions that they want to ask uh, to Evan. Another fun thing to do would be to go to some of the city lakes, uh, stay after dark, and find a sandbar that you can stand on use a big black popper and cast towards that close side of the weed edge. Um, that is the best uh, uh, largemouth bass fishing I've ever had in my life. It has to be after dark, a black popper shows a better silhouette at night, believe it or not. Um, and the largemouth bass go nuts for them. Uh, so any of the city lakes, that's a great fun thing to do. Uh, what am I drinking? This is uh, 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 tequila and uh, club soda with a lime in there. It's really hot and muddy down here today, so I'm trying to stay cool. <laughs> and I'm sure the tequila is helping with that. Dude, yep. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Evan, uh, I just have one last question. I know that you've been very involved with trout in the classroom. And actually, I understand that in the summertime, you spend most of your time guiding for mm -hmm. fishing. Uh, but you have been involved, I think, in setting up these um, fishing skills programs uh, that are happening in parks throughout the metro. And we're trying to recruit volunteers to um, uh, to sign up to, to help kids and families learn how to fish. So I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about what those um, programs are like, you know, maybe what is the typical fishing skills program? What does it involve? Uh, just let our members know why they might want to volunteer. Absolutely. Uh, so a, um, a large portion of our trout in the classroom program obviously happens during the year where the kids uh, raise fish, learn about water quality and fishing, uh, and, and we're just ending our fish release season. In the summertime, the fun doesn't stop though. Uh, we have partnered with a whole bunch of different uh, parks and recs departments across the metro, seven county metro, um, and we are offering 15 uh, and probably some more um, uh, scheduled um, learn how to fish events for youth and families. Uh, most of these events are spin fishing. Uh, so think a closed faced reel uh, with, with a bobber, bobber sinker and hook. Um, and these are two hour long programs where these youth get to show up. Most of them, this is their first time fishing ever. Uh, so um, in previous years, it's been uh, uh, various instructors helping teach these programs. This summer, we really want to get the community involved uh, to make this sport more um, accessible um, to allow uh, all parties to, to benefit from these sorts of experiences. Um, uh, learning from, from someone who's super excited about it will make the kids super excited about it. And that's our whole goal. Uh, so these two hour programs, uh, we teach the kids everything about the exact equipment, um, the different types of lures, how to use those lures, uh, everything to where to find fish in a lake, um, or how to set the hook, um, how to properly catch and release fish. Uh, so they're really all encompassing programs uh, where the first half is really pretty much instructional with some hands on games. The last half, we're on the pier slaying fish. So um, uh, like I mentioned, this is this is an opportunity for these kids to catch their first fish ever. Our instructors and volunteers are helping that happen. Um, and uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, families and youth coming back saying 
uh, hey, this was really cool and I have my own fishing pole now and here's some of the fish I've caught <laughs> in my neighborhood lake. Um, so uh, it's, it's really important to me to, to, to share these sorts of experiences with youth across the metro because uh, that's how I started. I grew up fishing these lakes and these waters. Um, uh, the more we can help youth understand what a watershed is, what is living in this lake down their house that they probably bike and swim by every day. Um, it's another way to get them hands on and engaged with the natural world. So uh, super fun time. Our programs are running, running from uh, first weekend of June all the way through August. Um, so if you want more info, um, I would reach out to, uh, you can reach out to me, I can get you to the right people. Uh, Gary Witchrock is our youth, uh, uh, youth programs coordinator on the board right now. You can reach out to him as well. Uh, but we would love some people, uh, uh, the more hands the better, uh, to, to assist with casting practice or uh, showing kids how to put a worm on a hook. Um, we do have some fly casting programs out there. Uh, so if you want to show kids how to cast a fly rod and the difference between a dry and an infinite streamer, you don't need to be an expert. You just need to uh, uh, love fishing. And I think all of us here probably do. So um, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. We'll get you involved if you want to be. Well, thank you, Evan. Uh, I will, uh, on Thursday, I will send out uh, links and email addresses to all of the information that's been presented tonight, including a link to um, a recording of Evan's presentation and also uh, who to contact if you are interested in uh, volunteering for uh, summer fishing programs. I'm going to send that out on Thursday because I'm going fishing tomorrow. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. but nice. anyways, I, want, I want to thank all of you for attending. Uh, we're taking a summer break now so we can all fish and uh, hopefully by the time we get to September we will be able to meet uh, face to face we'll keep a zoom link but uh, we hope we can meet live. So everybody if you get a chance uh, put a thumbs up on your screen for Evan. Evan thank you very much this was a terrific presentation. Thank you all I hope to see you out in my some of my spots. <laughs> I'll share some carp flies with you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, uh, Evan. Thank you, everybody. And as I mentioned, we will be uh, doing a drawing for, uh, for that fly box from Paul as well. So anyway, have a pleasant evening and we'll see you guys in September. Take care. Thanks all.